Have you ever wondered if there is a healthier way to handle setbacks and disappointments in your close relationships? Maybe you found yourself avoiding tough conversations, dropping hints, over-functioning to try and get more reciprocation from your partner, or waiting until you're too upset to have a constructive conversation. Or maybe you've gotten to the point where you're wondering if this relationship is even good for you. It's tempting to think that the absence of disappointment is the defining characteristic of a strong, healthy relationship. But the truth is that strong, healthy couples, friends and family members, know how to use the conflict and messiness of the relationship to grow, heal, and deepen their trust in themselves and each other. Today on the podcast, I want to talk about some common mistakes that people make when they're handling disappointment and unmet expectations and some healthier ways to work through it. By the end of this episode, you should be able to reflect on what you're doing now and how to move forward in a healthier way. This is Respected and Connected, the podcast that helps you create a more collaborative, intimate relationship. I'm Sharon Costanzo, and I'm your no-nonsense relationship coach. I've helped people just like you create stronger, more fulfilling relationships using the Better Marriage Blueprint. My mission is simple, to help you explore the complexity of intimate relationships, challenge your assumptions about what it takes to make it work, and advocate for the kind of relationship you really want. You don't have to settle for a lonely, unsatisfying marriage, and I'm here to give you some tools and ideas about how to take the next step forward. So if you're open to the idea that handling disappointment well is the key to building a stronger, healthier relationship, this episode is for you. But before we get started, I need to give a big shout out to Connor. He's been editing and uploading my podcast episodes for a few months now, and it's been such a load off my plate as I've been working on growing and improving the podcast. I've been in a very busy season of my life, and he's been instrumental in helping me to get each episode out on time every week. So send Connor an email or find him on social media if you're looking for some help with your podcast. I also just want to mention one other small housekeeping issue. Uh, We're getting close to the end of the year. The holidays can be a stressful time for anyone who's experiencing challenging family dynamics, whether it's with your spouse, your family, or your in-laws. If you've been dreading the holidays because it seems impossible to keep everyone happy, or you feel like your wants and needs aren't being considered, you can schedule a one-off session with me to get some insight and advice on how to handle some of these difficult family dynamics. The link to schedule a single session with me is respectedandconnected.com slash gridlock. And act fast because my calendar is especially busy this time of year. Okay, so now let's talk about disappointment. I feel like this topic is particularly relevant right now at least to me, because we just had a very contested presidential election here in the U.S., and half of the country is feeling various levels of disappointment. It seems like there's, you know, there's always something going on that's disappointing in our lives, but right now people are feeling it particularly strongly, and it's probably impacting some of your close personal relationships as well. And while I'm not going to talk specifically about how to handle the disappointment of the election, if you're the one who's feeling disappointed right now, I hope some of these ideas will help you to navigate whatever kinds of disappointments you're dealing with right now. And and just to give you a silly example of kind of how I I want to talk about this and work through it, I I told my husband this morning I was going to come in and work on my podcast way past the time that i promised Connor I would do it, but that's a whole nother story. So I'm working on my podcast. I We're lucky enough to have our kids at their grandparents today, so I have a little bit of extra time to focus on this work. I come upstairs to my office. I shut the door. I'm working on some things, probably doing a little bit of shiny object syndrome. Oh, what do I need to do to really be ready to produce a great episode today? And I, I take a little break, go downstairs to switch the laundry, and I smell bacon but there is no bacon to be seen. And I kind of just teased my husband, you know, I said, mm, it smells like bacon. And he said to me, yeah, you know, I was making bacon and I would have asked you 
if you wanted some, but your door was closed and I knew that you probably didn't want to be bothered. And I was like, okay, no problem. So I, I kicked the can down the road. I did a little bit more procrastinating and made myself some breakfast. But depending on your relationship, a disappointment like this could feel like a micro disappointment. You know, this is just a one-off. This is just the daily disappointment of living with someone else who doesn't always read our minds and agree with us and feel the way we feel about everything. Or it could feel like a macro disappointment. Like I live with someone who never thinks about my needs, um, is always just taking care of themselves without any thought of me. And I, you know, I, I'm doing all of this. I'm over-functioning in the relationship. I'm providing them this, all of these helps and comforts that I don't think they're reciprocating. So that's kind of the difference between a micro and a macro disappointment. Just in the fact that my husband didn't make me bacon for breakfast. So we'll get a little bit more into some of these kind of things as we go through this episode and talk through some things. So we have micro and macro disappointments. Um, if we can be specific and avoid generalizing our disappointment when we communicate it, that can be super helpful. Another cause of disappointment often in our relationships is we aren't really communicating our needs, values, and expectations clearly. We do kind of expect that over time our partner will get better at understanding us, maybe even if we don't communicate it. And, and sometimes that can be a little bit of a fantasy. One of the things that I hear often when I talk to women, um, this is just kind of a pattern in heteronormative relationships, is something like the husband is making financial decisions without my input. And I'm really disappointed about that. The way I understand and communicate that disappointment is, is pretty important, though. And the way I think of it and the way I would coach a client on this is, you know, yes, that's very disappointing, especially if you have a value of partnership and equity in your relationship. And sometimes when we bring this kind of a thing up, if we bring it up more as a cr criticism or a complaint, the partner who's receiving the criticism or complaint is going to feel defensive. And they might um, respond to that, that accusation or that criticism by saying, you know what, my brother handles things this way in his marriage. They have a perfectly happy relationship. His wife doesn't have any complaints about the way this is handled. So you should just back off. Um, there's problems with this on both ends. Uh, and there is a better way to handle it. It could be something like, hey, this might have been okay and, and previously in our relationship, but my, you know, my values have changed, my needs have changed, I've become more aware of how I really want this to be handled, and this is what I would like. Um, so that's kind of a way of approaching it without making assumptions by saying, you know what, there are times when I have let this slide, or there are people that we both know that handle things this way and they're okay with it, However, I am not. So just being a little bit more clear and explicit about your values and your expectations can really help to smooth some of these kinds of disappointments. Another one that's a little bit trickier and maybe a little bit more difficult is if trust has been broken. If there's been some sort of betrayal, you know, your partner has understood what the expectations of the relationship are, maybe you know, what your agreed um, expectation of monogamy is in the relationship, and maybe they've kind of veered into some gray area around that. Maybe you've made a clear agreement about how something is, is going to be handled in your relationship, and they have not followed through on that agreement. That's another time when you're going to feel a little bit more than just that micro-level disagreement because there has been open communication, because there have been clear agreements, and those agreements have not been handled. I'm not going to get really in deep to that kind of broken trust level of disappointment today, just because I think it, there's a lot more nuance in that conversation, and it would be really helpful to get more context from you, the person dealing with that, to give, to give more examples of how to handle that. But I do want to acknowledge that that is a time when we can feel a lot of disappointment in our relationships. Another thing that I hear often from my clients that can be really disappointing is um, how things kind of fold out or how things kind of play out when there are changes in life circumstances. 
you know, so going from, you know, being single and dating to starting your life together, getting married, if that's how you do it, or committing to live together and start your life together in that way, you probably have some expectations about how that's going to play out. And it doesn't play out perfectly the way that you envision it in your mind. Another time when this happens is when you start adding children to your family and you have different expectations about what everyone's role and responsibility is going to be when children come into the picture. You know, again, when kids go to school, whose job is what and, and how do those different responsibilities and goals play out? Um, career changes is another big one. Another one I see often, and I work with women on this and, you know, couples really is we're looking into our retirement and we have different kind of ideas and expectations about what our retirement is going to look like. And, you know, we're going to have more time together than we used to. And, and what do we each want for this stage of our lives? So there are a lot of changes in life circumstances that can be the cause of disappointment and can also be an opportunity to communicate. And that's kind of the next part of this episode is talking about communicating expectations and communicating disappointment. There is a really high cost for not communicating your feelings, especially those uncomfortable or negative feelings. Because trying to hide your true feelings, it doesn't work. Uh, unless you are truly accepting of the situation that you're in without resentment, you cannot really fully hide those true feelings. And if you're, if you're managing them without being really honest with your partner, they're going to come out kind of sideways in unhealthy ways. And it does, it impacts the trust in your relationship. You know, if you use kind of sarcasm to communicate what you're feeling, if you are starting to avoid day-to-day -day interactions because you're feeling frustrated and you, you don't want to communicate that frustration, that has a negative impact on your relationship. And so it's really vital to learn how to process and communicate well, especially these negative feelings and emotions and disappointments, if you want a healthy, trusting relationship. And I also want you to think of this as an opportunity. Um, an opportunity to learn and grow through these difficult moments because really it is the couples, the family members who see it as an opportunity, who are able to create space in the relationship to repair and navigate kind of the messiness of humanity. That's where the real healing and trust and genuine authentic connection is created. It's not this fairy tale fantasy of if I pick the right partner, or if I orchestrate the perfect conversation that things are going to be just beautiful and easy. That's a fantasy and a fairy tale. So I want you to pay attention to kind of some of these common mistakes or unhealthy coping mechanisms. And many of these come from Terry Reel's book, The New Rules of Marriage. Um, as you guys know, I use a lot of Terry Reel's work because I am a Terry Reel trained relationship practitioner. So these first five are common mistakes or unhealthy coping mechanisms. So the first is trying to be right. I'm going to deal with this disappointment by trying to be right. And one of those examples is, you know, if you go to your husband and say, hey, I really would like to be considered more in financial decisions. I would like my input to be considered about how you make investments, how you decide, you know, to buy life insurance policies for the kids, um, you know, big purchases, all of those things. I want us to communicate that and work together as a team on that. And if they respond by trying by being right, or you, you know, you go through this is the right way to do things rather than this is how I want to do things, or they respond by saying, you know what, other people handle this just fine. The way I'm doing it is the right way. Other women that I know are perfectly happy to handle things this way, so therefore you should too. That's kind of the being right approach. The next one is control. And usually controlling behavior comes with the thought of, how can I get my partner to 
do things the way I want them to do. It can be really direct, like I'm going to tell them how it is. This is what you should do. Now do it. Or it can be a little bit more indirect, like manipulative, like um, kind of bringing up a conversation of like, well, what do you think is the right way to handle this financial situation? And trying to kind of lead them to see things the way that you do and, and get them to do that. Nobody likes to be controlled. So trying to control the outcome in that way is not going to work. The next losing strategy that Terry Real talks about is called unbridled self-expression. And that's kind of when we take, you know, maybe that micro disappointment and generalize it for the whole thing, you know. And maybe we try and bring things up in a healthy way and say, hey, I'm really bothered by this. And they kind of dismiss you or get defensive. Then your your response to that is, well, this is why I'm right. And let me give you all of the examples of how you've done this for the whole 15 years of our relationship and what a terrible partner you are. So unbridled self-expression is when we spew out every example we can think of. It's usually an attempt to be heard when we're not feeling heard, but it, it doesn't work to really help us to be heard and to really salvage the relationship or restore some connection and trust in the relationship. It's just, I'm unhappy. Here are all of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm unhappy. I'm justified to be unhappy because all of these things that have happened to me. Um, so unbridled self-expression is another example of an unhealthy coping mechanism or an unhealthy response to disappointment. The next is retaliation. And usually we don't see ourselves as retaliating. We see ourselves as maybe like thinking of, oh, well, if I can get them to feel the pain that I'm feeling, maybe they will want to change. So retaliation could be, you know, my partner's not listening to me. They don't appreciate everything that I'm doing. So I'm going to quit doing their laundry. I'm not going to communicate openly with them and say, you know what, I feel like I'm really overburdened and I'm not getting the help I need. So I'm going to stop doing your laundry. It's more passive aggressive of just, I'm going to stop and see if they notice. And if they feel bad about it, maybe they'll change their behavior. So there's kind of two different different ways to approach these things. One is kind of being a little bit more subtle about your communication, not clear, not honest, not giving the other person an opportunity to have a voice in the discussion, or... Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about some skills that you can do to, to handle this better. So retaliation is one. The next is withdrawal. You know, usually we have a two-step. We try something, and if it doesn't work, eventually we, we withdraw. And this isn't like a healthy taking some space to figure myself out. This is more like the silent treatment, or maybe I'll just stop going to family parties and see if they notice and they come and ask me about it. It's more of a passive... I'm going to withdraw either because I, I can't handle being in this relationship or I'm really hoping that they'll notice that I've withdrawn and kind of try and close that gap. So the other one that Terry Real doesn't talk about specifically that I think is really important to talk about, and this is, you know, I'm sure there's many places where you can read more about this, but the book Everything Isn't Terrible by Kathleen Smith she talks about this concept of triangulation. And this is, you know, when we're feeling the stress or pressure in a specific relationship and we don't have the skills or confidence to handle that with the person that we're struggling with, we triangulate. We talk to somebody else about it. This is really common in enmeshed families. You know, I'm having a problem with my brother. I don't want to talk to him about it. It's really uncomfortable. It hasn't gone well. So I'm going to talk to my mom or my sister-in-law, and that we kind of have two hopes, or we kind of have two strategies for this. Sometimes triangulation, just venting to someone else, it relieves the pressure of that enough that we can, you know, that we can handle it, that we can tolerate it. Or we say something in hopes that they will go deliver that message to the other person and they'll, um, they'll come back and repair with us. It just breeds distrust and discomfort in the relationship when we triangulate. It makes sense that we do it, you know, we, when we feel too much pressure in our relationships and we don't have the tools um, and the like emotional capacity to deal with it, we will. We'll try being right. 
We'll try control. We'll try unbridled self-expression, retaliation, withdrawal, or triangulation. It's very normal and human to do these things until we start to build up the skills and capacity to handle things better. And I promise you that if you're the person who's working on building these tools and strategies and you're you're looking for people who also have the capacity to do this with you, you will become stronger, you will become more emotionally mature, and you will heal some of these unhealthy patterns that you've learned um, in previous relationships because you're committed to learning these things. So we've talked a little bit about unhealthy coping mechanisms. I want to talk about a few skills for communicating disappointment. The first is a Gottman famous skill, and it's trying a soft startup, using a soft startup. And this can be really hard to do when we've let tension and frustration build up over time. But I want you to kind of just imagine, you know, if this person were acting in good faith and I was telling them for the very first time something that was that was on my heart that was bothering me with the confidence that they could respond well, how would I bring it up? One of my favorite phrases is, hey, I really care about you and I want to have a healthy relationship with you. And I'd like to share with you a little bit about something that's been bothering me. Is now a good time? Another thing that we can say is just take responsibility for our part. I may have given you the impression in the past that this wasn't a problem for me. You know, that the way you're handling finances or me doing most of the chores without your help, I, I, I probably did let it go for too long. And that gave you the impression that it was okay. But it's not okay for me now. And I want to talk about how, how things are going and maybe how we can do things differently. So we're being very collaborative. We're taking responsibility for our part. We're speaking from the I. We're avoiding blame and criticism. And we're assuming positive intent. Those are kind of all some of these soft startup skills. The next one is the skill of using the feedback bill. And again, this is a skill that Terry Real teaches in the New Rules of Marriage, and it's a skill that I specifically coach my clients with more in my individual coaching programs. So if you're looking for more help with how to kind of navigate the nuances of this and, and address the barriers and roadblocks that you specifically are facing, please reach out to me to work with me individually. But the feedback wheel in a nutshell, there's four parts of the feedback wheel. And the feedback wheel also always starts with asking the other person, can we talk about this? Because in adult relationships, we don't force ourselves on one another. We don't force someone to have a conversation or pressure them or coerce them into having a difficult conversation with us. We start with asking for permission. Can we talk about this? Is now a good time? And if they say no, then our job then is to handle our own disappointment and not push it, not at that moment. We can continue on going to say, you know what, it's really important to me for us to have a healthy relationship to be able to resolve and repair this issue. Can we do it? When can we do it? Stay calm Trust yourself that you can handle whatever happens next, whatever disappointment happens next, but start with permission. And then the four steps. The first is to describe the experience from a very objective point of view. So what would a video camera, a fly on the wall, see? Not the feelings, not the interpretation, not the story that you tell, but what happened. You went out and purchased a life insurance policy for one of our kids without talking to me. That's what happened. The second step is what I made up about that. And what I made up about that is that you don't think it's important to consider my opinion when you make financial decisions. The next part is how I felt about it. I felt um, upset. I felt sad. I felt angry. Um, I felt a little bit of shame, like maybe you don't respect me very much. So those are what I feel about it and what I would like. 
I would like if we could take a look at our finances together and, and make those decisions together. So that one of the things about the feedback wheel, especially to avoid unbridled self-expression, is to use one or two sentences for each of those steps. So you might need to sit down and, and journal or talk through with yourself or maybe with a friend who's also studying this kind of work but isn't the person that you need to repair with to kind of get clear on each of these four items. You know, what happened, what I made up about it, how I felt because of the story that I made up, and what I would like to make things better. This feedback wheel is really powerful. A lot of people have a lot of trouble kind of learning it and practicing it and getting it right. That's why I think working with a coach who, who uses this skill is really important and I can help you with that. But use the feedback wheel, be short and sweet and to the point and um, stay on your side of the street. One of the reasons why this feedback wheel is so helpful is because it helps you to focus on specific behaviors rather than generalizing. A lot of times when we're experiencing disappointment, we start to generalize. This person is inconsiderate. You know, as we're talking about the election, this is happening a lot. You know, everybody on the left, we generalize what they feel. You know, they don't care about unborn children. They don't care about the economy. They don't care about gun rights, whatever you're, you know, if you're on the other side of things, whatever you generalize about people on the left or people on the right, you know, all they care about is money. They don't care about individual people's rights. They don't care about minorities or autonomy or any of those things. So focus on specific behaviors rather than generalizing. Do that in political discussions and do that in personal discussions as well. You know, we, we've talked about making the bed in the morning and that hasn't been happening. Rather than you're inconsiderate, you're thoughtless, you, you always leave all of the extra chores for me to do. So the feedback wheel really helps you to focus on those specific behaviors rather than generalizing. But be aware of when you might be doing this just in your day-to-day -day life as well, generalizing other people's behaviors. And the other part I love about the feedback wheel that I want to point out is that final step, what could help me feel better what I would like, this is really empowering the other person by letting them know how they can get it right. Letting them know how they can be successful instead of criticizing or complaining. You're giving them a path forward instead of just telling them what not to do. I cannot even imagine what would happen in our political environment if we were to be able to do this and really create win-win solutions that consider different viewpoints and that really focus on what we have in common rather than our differences. Just as you kind of think about and process what I'm sharing today, I want to encourage you to help you move forward, to reflect on a situation that hasn't gone well in the past, and think about some of the skills that I shared today and how you could use them either to repair that situation, you know, use the feedback wheel to go back and say, you know, this is how it happened. This is what I would like right now to help me feel better or to do better in the future. And I think this is so interesting because as I think about all of these things that I share with you, I want to let you know that I'm navigating all of this mess in my own personal life as well. And I just had, I told my husband about this. I just had a dream the other night about an ongoing difficulty that I'm having in one of my relationships. And it's taken me a while to really come, you know, make peace with it and come to terms with it and think about how to be more productive and constructive in that relationship. And in this dream, I had a dream that it happened again, this situation that happens where I feel really attacked and confronted and unfairly treated and I had this just very clear vision of how I would respond if it happened again. And it gave me a lot of peace that even though things haven't gone well in the past, I feel peace and hope that if that came up again, I could handle it better in the future. And that's what I want for you. That's what I want for you to get from this today. So I hope this has been helpful. And just in conclusion, you know, we're talking about disappointments in our relationships some of them are really big, 
Some of them are kind of small. Um, keep in mind, you know, that if you can avoid generalizing, if you can focus on specific situations, you're going to be a lot more effective and successful in navigating these situations, creating a win-win way forward, creating more trust and authentic connection in your relationships. And that's what I want for myself, and that's what I want for you as well. And that's a wrap on today's episode. I hope you found today's discussion insightful and empowering. But before you go, are you feeling stuck in a difficult relationship? Maybe you're struggling to communicate your needs or set healthy boundaries. If so, I want to invite you to check out my special offer for podcast listeners, a one-on-one coaching session designed to help you gain clarity and confidence in your relationships. In this session, we'll work together to help you understand your own needs, communicate more effectively, and decide on the healthiest way to move forward. To learn more and book your session, simply visit respectedandconnected.com gridlock. Thanks for listening, and I'll catch you in the next episode.